Praise God. Thank you, Raphael and the group and uh, for the wonderful worship and the way you've led us this evening. We deeply appreciate that. And uh, I'd like us to pray before I begin this evening. Father, thank you, Lord God, with all of my heart. I thank you for the anointing of your Holy Spirit. Lord, you are speaking to your church in this generation. God Almighty, would you grant to us that we may have the ears to hear what your Spirit is speaking to us. Give us hearts to embrace truth. Give us the will to live the kind of a life that you call us to live. Lead us, Lord, out of places we shouldn't be. Lead us away from thoughts we shouldn't be thinking. Give us the mind of Christ. Father God, in Jesus' name, I ask you for the anointing of your Holy Spirit, for this is a desperate moment in history. God, it's a desperate hour. We're entering that season that you spoke of, where you shall be hated of all nations for my namesake. God, help us. Give us the grace to get into the place where we need to be, that we may make a difference in our time. And we thank you for it. Anoint this frail vessel, my God, one more time. Let your word have preeminence and let it find its mark in every mind, every heart. God, I'm asking you in Jesus' name to raise up people tonight who feel weak and raise them up to be mighty warriors in your kingdom. As you did with David the king in the days when he was pursued by Saul, you brought to him people who were distressed in debt and discontent. They walked in weak and they came out of that cave strong and they took on giants and they fought lions and they became mighty in your kingdom. God, you are the same yesterday, today and forever. You don't change, Lord. We too, and we try to change you, but we can't, you're the same. So help us to embrace the things we need to understand tonight and in the days ahead. And we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. Praise God, thank you so much. Thank you for all that you've done this evening. We're gonna have communion at the end of the few thoughts that I've, I have to share <clears throat> this evening. So if, if you have the time to get some bread and some juice in your kitchen and just prepare to, any bread, any juice whatsoever, and just prepare to celebrate communion with us, the shed blood and the body of Christ on the cross 2,000 years ago for our sin. Now, October the 6th, <clears throat> put that on your calendar and tell your friends. Get it out on social media. Uh, I want to just give you a story for a moment. In 1857, a young man who was a minister in training, his name was Jeremiah Lanfear, a businessman really, who was learning to preach the gospel and was given charge of evangelism, of reaching a certain community in, uh, in Manhattan, in New York City. <clears throat> and he simply printed up a poster and he put it on some poles around about the area where he was. And on the poster, it simply said, if you are as concerned about the future of this city and this country as I am, join with me to pray. And from that humble beginning, I believe the first meeting, there was only about six people showed up to the first meeting. <clears throat> but from that beginning, a prayer meeting began that swept the country and the estimates range up to two million people were swept into the kingdom of God. Prayer hit churches everywhere. People whose hearts were hardened to the things of God suddenly came under the conviction of the Holy Spirit. They would gather in churches. There was public confession of sin. People confessed to all kinds of things that were in their lives that they needed to get right with God from. And it was a great and glorious spiritual awakening. So October the 6th, Here's what I'm doing tonight. I'm putting a poster up as, as best as I can and saying, if you care about this country and you're concerned about the future as I am, would you join me on October the 6th, Tuesday night, worldwide prayer meeting from 7 to 9 p.m. We'll be bringing this prayer meeting from Plymouth, Massachusetts. On, in the house, it sits on the foundation of the very first house in America where the half of those who landed in 1620 on the shores of Plymouth, Massachusetts, who survived, prayed. They prayed on that very spot, and God made a covenant with them. They had no strength, they had no plan, they had no go-forward strategy, and they were surrounded by enemies. But God gave them favor. And from that simple covenant that he made with them 400 years ago, a nation was born, arguably one of the greatest nations that's ever been on the face of the earth. God's favor has been on this nation.
but it's been 400 years. And as many cultures have done before us, we've dealt loosely with this incredible blessing that God gave us. So we're going to go back to the place where the nation began one month before the election in November. And we're going to ask God's forgiveness for what we did with the freedom that he gave to us. And people from not just in Plymouth, but people all over the country are going to be streamed in as you saw Alder David streamed in tonight. And we're going to be praying for the mercy of God, not just confessing our sin, but praying for the mercy of God for our children, for our homes, for our families, for our schools, for our society, for racial reconciliation. We're going to be praying for all of these things. And I'm asking you to join with us if you really care about the future of this nation. Folks, we may not get another chance after this. You have to understand how serious this moment is in our country right now. I don't know if what the future holds, but I do know this one thing. If, if there's no intervention of God, if God's people don't humble themselves, the future is going to be very, very dark for this nation and perhaps a lot of other places throughout the world as well. This is a serious moment. Mark it down. Let this be a grassroots prayer movement across America. Just tell your friends to tell their friends to tell their friends to tell their friends to tell their friends. The social networking is already out there. If people put this plea out on Facebook, and it's really not, it's really just gather in your homes. Gather wherever you can. Gather on a park bench with a cell phone. Just gather wherever you can gather with whomever is concerned about the future of this nation and pray with us. Pray with us. That's all we're asking you to do. Take one and a half to two hours out of your time and your life and let's pray together and let's believe God for another moment of mercy on this wonderful nation called America. God bless you. Now, tonight... <clears throat> I'm, I'm going to talk to some people this evening. Now, we, I'm going to read to you a few prayer requests, and I'm going to go into a message that is built from the, off of the message that Pastor Tim Delina spoke on Sunday morning. On Sunday morning, he talked about learning to defeat an old way of thinking or, or fighting against wrong thinking by embracing a right way of thinking. I love that theme, and it's so important for us now as the Church of Jesus Christ in this time that we're living in, we've got to have the courage at least to say, God, has our thinking been wrong? And there's just something that we need to embrace. Are you trying to get a hold of us to do something we might not have considered yet? I'm talking to Lydia tonight in Poland. <clears throat> it says, pray for Wisla to be set free from depression, also salvation for him and his family. To somebody from Florida, it says, pray for my friend who's going blind. He loves to read. He did something bad, he may go to prison. I think he knows deep down he needs to get right with God. From Oxford in the UK, I'm just crying nonstop since yesterday. Ten years ago, I lost my father in an accident, and a year after that, I got divorced. Please pray for my breakthrough. This is Amy in the UK tonight. Somebody in Arizona City, Arizona, says, I need help to be delivered from porn. I ask God to deliver me. And he does, but I keep going back, just as a dog goes back to a, his vomit and a fool to his folly. And somebody anonymous here in the United States says, Jesus, keep me in the fight. I'm overwhelmed with fear and despair over my seven children raised for Christ who are living in sin in this world. And my husband too, Jesus, help. So now tonight, I'm speaking to you and everyone out there who's submitted a prayer request like these or maybe on the margins of these prayer requests I'm not speaking to you as somebody who's in despair tonight. I'm not speaking to you as somebody who's did something wrong and might have to spend time in prison. I'm not speaking to somebody tonight who's suffering from depression or nonstop crying since yesterday. I'm not speaking to somebody tonight who needs to be delivered from porn. I'm not speaking to you in that context. I want to talk to you about learning to become the mighty warrior, the mighty man, the mighty woman of God that you actually are. The things that you're struggling with in many cases, not every case, but the things that you're struggling with is because you're living in a place other than where God would have you to live. And you're doing things other than what God has called you to do. Therefore, you find yourself embracing thoughts. As Pastor Tim said on on Sunday morning, you're embracing thoughts that are getting to be strongholds in your life. So you spend your whole week trying to get out of one thing and out of another thing and out of another thing, when in reality, God is trying to get you not just out of these things, but he's trying to bring you in to something that he has for 
your life. Philippians chapter 2 in the New Testament, we're talking about a new way of thinking. So I'm going to start here in Philippians chapter 2, and then I'm going to go to Joshua chapter 5, and then after that, we're going to go to communion together. Now, in Philippians chapter 2, if I start at verse 3, now Paul is, is going to be speaking in context, all right? So that means he's making a statement, and then he's going to bring it into, into an example that furthers his statement. So I, I want us to follow this. In verse 3, he says, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit. In other words, okay, all that we do as the people of God, don't let it be because you want to shine. Don't let it be because you're just simply looking for something that's going to make yourself only more comfortable or give you a reputation maybe among people. But in loneliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Can you imagine if we just embraced that one verse of scripture in this generation? The rioting in our cities would stop almost immediately. There certainly would be no Christian people involved in it. I can, I can almost guarantee that if we esteemed every other person better than ourselves. Verse 4, he says, let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. So now we're still in the same context of what he's saying. Don't do anything just for your own glory or for your own need. Esteem others better than yourself. Look, don't just be looking only for your own comfort, your own safety, your own security, just anything that is, brings something to you, but look to the needs of others. Then he goes into verse five and says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Now, Pastor Tim talked about getting rid of an old way of thinking and embracing a new way of thinking. Let this mind be in you. Let this be our prayer tonight. My God, give me this mind. I don't know about you, but it is mine. I said, God, you, you have to take me out of, of living in a place of self-concern and self-consumption and focus on self and all everything else that just goes with, with, with living in that realm that's so deficient. Uh, for the kingdom of God. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking on the form of a bond servant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Let this mind be in you. Therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name. Amazing. You know, when God sent his son, Jesus Christ was equal with God and it was not robbery to declare himself equal with God. And of course, being God, I mean, there is no greater reputation than being God. But the scripture says he made himself of no reputation. He humbled himself. He came down to this earth as a servant. He walked among men. In other words, he was, he was so much higher than we are that we couldn't even begin to, to bridge the gap between us. Yet he, he came down and he walked where we are. And the scripture tells us elsewhere that he became touched with the feelings of our struggles, our infirmities, our trials, our weaknesses. That's why we're invited to boldly come to the throne of God to find grace to help in our time of need. He did all of these things and he says, I want you to have this mind. I, I want you to, to move forward in a sense into this mass of struggling humanity the way the son of God moved towards you. Aren't you thankful tonight? I don't know about you, but I sure am. That he came to me when I wasn't even seeking him. He loved me when I didn't love him. He saw me when I didn't see him. And he could, have, he could have rightfully just turned away from me and turned his back and left me into an eternity uh, where he is not. But in the mercy of God, in the mind of God, he saw me and he moved towards me. And I believe in this generation as the church of Jesus Christ, we need to start seeing again humanity before us. We need to start seeing the struggles of others. We need to start seeing that there might be a pathway and a plan of God for each of our lives that's 
a lot bigger than what we thought we had for ourselves. But it involves, to find that plan, it, it involves like being separated from the thinking of this world. It, it involves a whole new mind. It, it means that we have to embrace something of God that caused the Son of God to leave where he was and come to this world, walk among us, suffering in a sense our infirmities, going to a cross and paying the price for our sin. We need to learn again to be obedient, even if it takes us to a place of suffering. You know, there's not much of that has been preached in the last maybe 20 years or so. I'm, I'm sure there's places it has been, but it's almost a gospel that's not heard anymore. We, we've, we've crafted another mind, may I put it that way. We, we've gravitated to a portion of the scripture, but we've pushed the other portion out of our thinking. And we're now living at a time where if we're going to make a difference as the church of Jesus Christ, the mind of Christ has to be given to us again. The ways of Christ have to become ours. Otherwise, we're just an irrelevant argument in the wind. That's all we are. We're going to be pushed to the sideline and these, the voices that are, are loud, louder than ours, are going to be the ones that dominate the moment, as is already happening in our culture. God has brought us into a, a place of reckoning. He's brought his whole church into a place where he's trying to speak to us again and talk to us about something that we're supposed to be, something we are, and a place where he is willing, if we're willing to go with him, he's willing to take us there. Now, in, in Joshua chapter 5, there was, a, there was a whole new generation of people that had been raised in the wilderness. Their forefathers had made the error of coming out of Egypt and choosing not to go into the place of promise that God had for them. They, and, and really, their choice was based on self-preservation. They went in and they looked at the size of the giants. They looked at the fortifications of cities that God told them will belong to them. And, and they, they drew the conclusion. And, and really, it's based on fear. They drew the conclusion that they're too much for us. They're too big for us. They're too strong for us. And re realistically, every man, every woman is standing there saying, if I do this, I'm, I'm going to suffer. I, I might even die. My freedom might be taken away. I don't know what, what was in their mind, but here, at least in the wilderness, at least they, they had provision, they had manna. In the wilderness, they, they were at least alive, and they probably wrongfully assumed that it's probably better to live here than to try to go in and, and fulfill the calling of God that's on our lives. And sad to say, generation to generation, there are always Christian people who make that choice. And they live in a spiritual wilderness. It's, it's not a place of victory and it's not a place of total defeat. It's just a place of nothing. Their life has no meaning. It has no influence. It, it conquers nothing for God. It doesn't operate in the supernatural. It's really relegated to the realm of just arguing doctrine and scripture. There's no, there's no supernatural power with them. Remember the apostle Paul said, your, your faith is not to stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. But there's not too many people who can say that anymore. Their whole faith is in the wisdom of, of, of their crafting uh, their arguments against the arguments of those that live outside the kingdom of God. Now, in Joshua chapter 5, this new generation, which we are, are being called of God to go into a place that those who came before them chose not to go. It's a place of having to fight. It's a place of having to obey. It's a place of having to do something greater in a sense than just crafting out their own safety and their own security. And ultimately, if you can hear it tonight, they were actually fighting for you and fighting for me. Had they not gone in, you just imagine the consequences there would have been. I mean, th this is a phenomenal thing. When you begin to think about it, they were, they, were, they were crafting, in a sense, the pathway that would ultimately lead to Christ being born in that promised land, going to the cross, dying on the cross. Then, of course, after he died, he became our promised land. As the believers in Christ in the New Testament, he is the promised land. It is all about Jesus Christ. Our life, our hope, our mind, our wisdom, our victory, our future, our strength, everything is in him. Every promise of God is not in a physical land anymore. It's now in the person of the Son of God Jesus Christ. Now, in chapter 5, in verse 2, before they went in, it said, at that time, in verse 2 of chapter 5 in Joshua, the Lord said to Joshua, make flint knives for yourself and circumcise the sons of Israel again the second time. 
So Joshua made flint knives for himself and circumcised the sons of Israel at the hill of the foreskins. And this is the reason why Joshua circumcised them. All the people who came out of Egypt who were males, all the men of war had died in the wilderness on the way when they'd come up out of Egypt. For all the people who came out had been circumcised, but all the people born in the wilderness on the way as they came out of Egypt had not been circumcised. You know, we, we, when, we, when we choose not to go in and conquer as Christ has called us to conquer, then everything that we raise up after us won't be separated. As we chose not to be separated, those who are raised up after us will also not be fully separated for the purposes of God. For the children of Israel, verse 6, walked 40 years in the wilderness till all the people who were men of war. You see, they didn't know what they were. Now, the Bible calls them men of war, but that's not what they called themselves. They called themselves grasshoppers. Do you remember that? We were grasshoppers in their sight. But no, that God called them men of war. That's why I'm speaking to you the way I am tonight. You're not what you think you are. You are what God says you are. That's why we have to learn to defeat an old way of thinking. And if you don't learn to defeat it, you will be laying on your mat the rest of your life, waiting for the waters to move so you can be healed. When Christ is standing beside you now, saying, will you be made whole? There's nothing you have to do but just simply believe that you are what he says you are. And in believing that, you simply get up, roll up your mat, and begin to walk and become a living miracle for the kingdom of God. You begin to pull down powers and principalities and spiritual wickedness in high places just by the fact that you are letting God call you and cause you to walk where he's called you to walk. Then suddenly there's a great victory. All the people who were men of war, verse 6, who came out of Egypt were consumed because they did not obey the voice of the Lord. In other words, God had a plan for each of them, but they chose security and safety and personal ease. They, they weren't really as concerned about the honor of God as they should have been. And the Lord swore that he would not show them the land which the Lord had sworn to their fathers that he would give us, a land flowing with milk and honey. Then Joshua circumcised their sons whom he raised up in their place, for they were uncircumcised. It's, it's a type like, for example, of a, of a generation raised up in the present church age. Was re, they're really not separated unto the things of God. They have a, a partial God thinking, but they also have a partial thinking that's of this world. They're, they're not separated unto God. Their thinking is not separated. Their lives are not separated. They're, they're, they know the scripture that says, as the Father has sent me, so now I send you. They know it, but they're not willing to follow it. They don't want to do it. And in great measure, there, there is, there's a portion of that part of their forefathers that said that we don't want to suffer for the cause of inheriting this land. We, we don't want to run the risk of losing our lives or freedom or whatever it is. And so they drew back and they, they would have had to craft their own religion in the wilderness. And there's there's nothing worse than a dry church. I don't know about if you feel, but that, that's, that's what happens when people do not walk with God. The church becomes a very, very, very dry place. A place that nobody really wants to go to. They, just, they, don't want to go to, they don't want to go to hell, so they feel they have to go to church on Sunday. Not that they really want to be there. Don't really want to hear the words that come from God if there's anything from God, even in the pulpit anymore. They live in a dry, dry place. And, and I don't know about you, but I don't want to live there. And I don't think you do either. And I'm, I'm going to try, because the Holy Spirit sent me tonight to get through to you, that you're not called to be where you are. And your whole life focus is not to be focused on the struggle that you're presently having. Remember that this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Let every man look on the things of others or think about the struggles of others and not just on his own struggles and trials. Now it says, so it was when they had finished circumcising all the people, they stayed in their places in the camp until they were healed. Then the Lord said to Joshua, this day I have rolled away the reproach of Egypt from you. Therefore, the name of the place is called Gilgal unto this day. So they were, they were about to experience marvelous victory. I mean, the, the first victory after this, this, this separating unto God is they were going to go uh, to Jericho. And you know the story of, of how they just, they didn't even have to do anything. 
Just march around. Don't say a word. Just seven days. Just march around. And when I tell you to shout, you shout. And God says, I'm going to give you the victory. And he gave them a, a marvelous, marvelous victory over a, a, a place that was, that was fortified. It was entranced. It, it, it declared that it had the dominance over the, the promised land, and, which it didn't, of course. God gave it to his own people. Now, in order for this generation to submit to this covenant, it was, circumcision was a covenant. It, it, was, it was a whole generation, a new generation coming to God and saying, our forefathers may have chosen security and safety over the glory and the honor of God, but we're going to, we're going to walk with you, Lord. We, we choose. And the Lord's saying, in, in order to do this, you have to come to a full recognition of the failures of the past. You, you, have, to, you have to reckon with it. You have to deal with it. it. The scripture in 2 Chronicles says, if my people called by my name will humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways. And the scripture says, it tells us there has to be a reckoning with our failures. We're living in a generation where our cities are on fire, folks. Do you understand? Our, our families are breaking down. Addiction is becoming rampant. Our whole society in America today is dissolving right before our eyes. And God help us as a church if all we can do is boast about how great we've been and all the wonderful things that we've done. Let's deal honestly with our failures. If we had truly lived for God the way we should have, there would be a thirst in this society for the supernatural, just as there was on the day of Pentecost. There's no getting around this truth. We've not been what we boasted about being. Many of God's people have lived in the wilderness, out of Egypt, but not into the place of promise. Out of, out of from under the penalty of sin, but not becoming what God wanted them to be, not doing what God called us to do, not conquering the things God called us to conquer. We've had no passion for prayer because in many cases, people were just content to dwell in this, this dry place and, and not have really a, a burden, not have the mind of Christ, this mind that caused him to come down from the throne where he was equal with God, his father. And, and condescend, as the scripture says elsewhere, to, to, to men of low estate and walk among us and become a servant and become obedient to the death of the cross. There has to be a reckoning with the failures of the past. Otherwise, we won't go in. Otherwise, we'll justify who we are. We'll, we'll look to blame somebody for the mess that the nation is in. When the mess, the blame realistically for the mess lands on the pulpits in America, and the people of God, there, there really is no escaping this. If we really were what we were called to be, the nation would be in the prayer meeting. They wouldn't be burning our cities at present. And then the issue of circumcision. Now, these, this new generation of men had to come forward. There had to be, there are three elements of circumcision, really. There's, there's, there's exposure and shame, there's pain, and there's separation. There has to be an admission. There has to be an admission in my heart, in your heart. I'm not, what, I'm not everything I should be. And God is obviously calling me to more. So God, would you give me the grace to, to take the next step? Would you give me the grace to step out of the crowd? Would you give me the grace to go farther than others say is far enough? Would you give me the grace to lose my freedom if necessary that others may gain theirs? Would you give me the grace to suffer? so that the sufferings of others may cease. Would you give me the mind of Christ? Would you help me, God, to, to go forward and become what I should? Would you, would you help me to get, get off this bed of self-pity and to get up and to begin to... to if, if you're looking for volunteers, let me be the first to step forward. Let me be the first to say, God, I am willing to identify with Christ. I'm willing to suffer the shame of rejection that this generation will give to those who belong to God if necessary. And yes, there's pain. There, there's, there's a certain pain that comes with separation. There's, there's the breaking of old relationships. There's the putting away of, of old habits. I, I'm going to suggest to you tonight, this gentleman that's stuck in pornography, the reason you are is because you're not separated unto God. It's really that simple. You're looking to gratify the desires of your own flesh because you've never experienced what God has for you and for your life. So I can stand here and minister to you for the next six years 
on this issue of pornography or challenge you to get up and get out from that place and suffer the pain of putting away old practices, old relationships, old ways of doing things and become separate unto God and an, and an embracing of that separation, an embracing of say, I'm going to be identified as a follower of Jesus Christ from this day forward. No more mumbling in the restaurant, wiping my brow, making it look like I'm praying. No more hiding in the closet. I'm going to declare, yes, and it's going to cost you. I'll tell you straight out in this generation, you can't have a biblical opinion and even have safety on your job anymore. You know that, I know that. But there has to be a willing, willingness for you and I and anyone else that God is calling to stand up and be separated for the purposes of God. If we're ever going to know the power of God again, being manifested through our lives. Then the scripture tells us in verse 11, it says, they ate the produce of the land on the day after Passover and unleavened bread and parched grain on the very same day. Then the manna ceased on the day after they had eaten the produce of the land and the children of Israel no longer had manna, but they ate the food of the land of Canaan that year. This is to me amazing. They, they stepped forward. They submitted to the covenant of circumcision. They declared themselves to be the people of God. They decided they were going to go in and fight and they didn't quite know what that was going to mean. They didn't know if some of them would lose their lives over it. But they said, we're going to go in because we're called of God to a higher cause than just living to preserve ourselves. Remember, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. We are called to a higher cause than living to preserve ourselves. I'm going to say it again. We are called to a higher cause than living to preserve ourselves. Now, in the season that they were in the wilderness, there was a grace covering them called manna. It was grace, but it manifested as manna. There was this bread from heaven while they were in the wilderness, while they were uncircumcised, while they were unseparated unto God, while they still hadn't made the decision to go into the promised land, there was this incredible grace. And, and every one of us have this grace. We come to Christ, we're forgiven our sins, and it can be a long time from when we come to Christ to when we decide to actually go in and become what God's called us to be. And in that season, there's this incredible, it's like God just rains provision on us. And he, and he showers his favor and he keeps us and sustains us. But there is a season where childish just has to be put away. There's a season where we become sons and daughters of God. There's a season where the, the calling of God and the mind of God have to become ours again. And the day they went in to the place of promise, the day they made the choice was the first day they began to eat the food of the land. And I love the original King James. It says they, they ate the old corn of the land. In other words, you know what I believe it means? The, they, they went back. It would be like people in our generation. They went back to what the Bible really says a Christian is. They went back to the old truths that are here that somehow got hidden in this self-consumed generation that has chosen to live in the wilderness. They went back to eating the promises of God. Because we know if we do go in and fully become what God's called us to be, it's only the food of this land that's going to keep us. We know that. It's not this, this, this heavenly grace that comes down to us when we're living in a place where we're not going backwards or forwards. When we make the choice to cross into the place that God, then suddenly the old corn, the old food of the land becomes available to us again. And we start reading passages of scripture that maybe we forgot about in our generation where we crafted this wilderness God of great ease that just lives to bless everybody and keep us all healthy and happy and secure and rich and everything else. And then suddenly when they went in, they made the choice to be separated. The old corn, the old, the food of the land became available. I just love that. In other words, they're not spoon fed anymore. They're opening the Bible and the word is coming to life. It's jumping off the pages. I don't know about you, but that's happening to me anew and afresh now in my life. 
I just love, I was writing down, I, I had so many things I've been writing down lately, I didn't even know what to speak tonight. It's wonderful when this book comes alive. It becomes the source of your strength. You're no longer looking for just free spirituality, may I put it that way? You know, where you go to church and somebody else makes you happy. You're not happy because you're eating yourself. You're eating for yourself, in other words. You're happy because somebody else is making you happy. For, but it doesn't last, you notice? You remember with the manna, they had to go out every day and get it, which is a good thing. Thank God for that. But when they crossed into this place, the land began to produce for them because they began, they chose to walk with God. And the very first thing that happens after they begin to eat of the land again is Jericho Falls. And we've got strongholds in our society today. We've got strongholds in our cities. We have strongholds in our culture. And there, there is really nothing, humanly speaking, that's going to make a difference. I, I personally believe that the bitternesses and divisions and uh, the, the godlessness has gone too deep now for any kind of a human response to adequately deal with it. It's going to have to be a divine response. And that which is of God always comes through his people, always has, always will. He ties the working of his hand into you and into me. And that's why he says, let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus. I'll tell you from my own heart, I, I honestly feel that hardship awaits me. I do. I feel and I've felt it for many years now, that if I continue on this path that I'm on now, that hardship awaits me. But it doesn't matter anymore because it's not about me, it's about others. It's about, it's about children who are not free. It's about marriages falling apart. It's about people who, who will never know that God loves them if somebody doesn't go to them and tell them. It's about a darkness that will swallow our entire nation if somebody doesn't stand up and fight again for those that have no courage to fight for themselves. And so I'm not going to suggest to you it's going to be easy. See, this is part of the, this is part of eating of the, of the food of the land because the early church knew this. The churches in some of the persecuted countries around the world know this. It's just America lost track of it about a generation or so ago. And we chose to live in the wilderness. But now we don't have that choice anymore. It's a do or die moment for this country and it's a do or die moment for the church of Jesus Christ in this country. And so coming to the communion table tonight, I am seriously considering the call of God on my life. He shed his blood and gave his body. And the scripture tells us that we're called to follow him and take up our cross. So I'm not trying to put away this old truth and make it palatable or easy because it might not be. Some of us might suffer. Some of us will suffer in the days ahead. But I want you to remember tonight that you are mighty in God. And what you are struggling with is something that God will deal with when you make the choice to, to step out of the crowd and say, I'm going with you, Lord. I'm going with you. Let that be tonight. As we touch this communion table, as we touch these communion elements, say, Lord, I'm, I'm stepping out. If, if, the, if all of humanity in America is all the church is lined up in a single line and you're looking for volunteers, God, I'm going to be the first to step forward. Now, I'm not going to step forward having it all together. I'm not going to step forward in any kind of personal perfection. I'm going to step forward just because you're calling me. And though I consider myself weak, you tell me I'm mighty. And so, Lord, I'm going to let your power and your life flow through my life for the sake of others because I want the mind of Christ to be my mind. And so, Father, thank you tonight for this great privilege of coming to your table, which again reminds us of what our calling is. This is what we are called to be. This is where we're called to go. I do pray for this church age in America that we would rediscover the old truths again. Oh, Jesus, Son of God, forgive us, Lord, for the wilderness Christianity that we crafted, the self-indulgent, view of the cross that we crafted. God, you were calling us to follow you and we've ended up gambling for your garments like the soldiers did. Forgive us, Lord, for this grave ignorance of your people and give us the grace 
to be called mighty again. Give us the grace to get up and go forward and understand that you have a plan for each of our lives. Oh God, help us so that others may be helped through us. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. We're gonna, if you have those elements that, uh, that uh, you went to your kitchen to get while we, when we began this message this evening, I'm going to ask if you could do that. Get those, please. And uh, we're going to have communion together now. What a great privilege this is. What a great privilege to know that I have access to God. What a great privilege to know that God ought to have access to me. And I, I'm just praying lately. I said, Lord, whatever hinders you in my life, would you, would you help me? Whatever thinking has gotten a hold of me that might not come from you, would you give me the grace to put it away? Help me, Lord, to be set apart for you. It's, it's no easier for me than it is for you. All of us, all of us that are partaking of communion tonight, we've all got our struggles. We've all got things that we would, we'd like to do, places we'd like to go. We all need the grace of God to become what God's calling us to be. I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. When he'd given thanks, he broke it and said, take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You know, today at home, I prayed a prayer. As I was preparing this few thoughts for tonight, I said, God, don't let me grow cold. Don't let me live on past successes. Don't let me stop now so close to the finish line. Help me, God. Help me to fight for all the people who have nobody to fight for them if we don't speak. Give me great grace. And that's my prayer for you tonight. So I'm challenging you, rise up. You are the mighty warriors of God. So Father, thank you for the time we've had together this evening. Thank you for the prayers that you've answered. Thank you for the marriages that you've healed, the bodies, the sick and bodies that have been touched of you. Thank you, Lord Jesus Christ, for giving peace in people's minds who are struggling, struggling with depression and anxiety. Thank you, Lord. There's peace, God, when you're leading us. Father, thank you. Thank you for this time of worship. God, we give you praise and glory. And we look forward to the day when you visit this nation once again in great mercy. God, give us a harvest that's so great that nobody could count it. Oh, God, we pray for every church, every denomination that it would be filled because your presence is in the house. Answer people's prayers, Lord. Let the strangers seek you and find you. Deliver the oppressed. Give sight to the blind. Heal those that have been bruised and wounded. Bring reconciliation in the nation in a way that only you can. Let there be a true love one for another, my God, of all people. We thank you for it. And we give you praise and glory in Jesus' name. It's been so good to be with you tonight. Thank you for taking the time to join with us in prayer. And we'll see you again. Pastor Tim will be up on Sunday morning. We'll see you again Sunday morning from New York City. So from New Jersey and our North Jersey campus, we just want to say tonight, good night. We love you. And see you again on Sunday. God bless you.